so much for joining us for this uh, South Pacific Central Bank's uh, Virtual Governors Forum. Um, before we start, just a few housekeeping matters uh, to our uh, panelists and of course to our um, to those that are joining us here this morning. Um, I'm just getting a message that uh, the minister has been called away for a parliamentary division. Um, but uh, we may have the Honorable Minister uh, Hawk address us a little bit later on. So, um, so with that, there'll be a, a slight amendment to, uh, to the program a little bit later on, but we'll, we'll keep it flexible as we all do in the Pacific. And of course, now it is my pleasure to invite uh, Professor Carolyn Evans, the Vice Chancellor and President of Griffith University, uh, a proud supporter of this wonderful uh, forum. Bulubinaka, Honorable Vice Chancellor. Good morning. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be with you all and, and thank you so much for your time. It's my great pleasure to formally welcome you to the conference. I begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the lands on which we meet. Uh, here at Griffith's Nathan, Nathan campus, that's the Turrbal and Yagara people, and we have campuses that represent uh, many of the rich diversity of Aboriginal uh, Australians, and I'd like to acknowledge the important role that they've played for many thousands of generations on this land. Uh, I would like to thank in advance of his attendance the Honourable Alex Hawke, Minister for International Development and the Pacific and the Assistant Defence Minister for agreeing to meet with us. I think we all understand that ministers are busy people whose timetables can be a little bit difficult, but I know he's still very keen to be with us today. Could I also acknowledge the governors, deputy governors, the senior management of the central banks of Fiji, PNG, the Solomon Islands, Vanuatu and Timor-Leste. We're delighted uh, that you could all be here today. Uh, and everybody is, of course, equally welcome, but we particularly would like to welcome back in some ways the Deputy Governor of Fiji's Reserve Bank, who is a Griffith alumnus, and we're very proud of that. We also welcome colleagues from the Reserve Bank of Australia, the Reserve Bank of New Zealand, the World Bank Group, the Asian Development Bank, the International Monetary Fund, and the Australia Pacific Business Council, and of course, my colleagues from Griffith University. It's such a pleasure to welcome each and every one of you to this very special, indeed I would say signature event, the first forum held between Griffith University and the Asian Development Bank. What makes this event historical and significant is the signing of a regional MOU between Griffith and our five South Pacific Central Bank partners. Over the last five years, led by Dr. Pamendra Sharma of the Griffith Asia Institute and the Department of Accounting and Finance Economics, and he's here with me today, and I would just like to take a moment to thank him for his really important leadership in this area. We've formed partnerships with the central banks of Fiji, PNG, Solomon Islands, Vanuatu and Timor-Leste. Bilateral MOUs have formed the basis of these partnerships, cementing Griffith's commitment to help central banks develop capacities for research and policy development uh, both of which I'm sure you would all agree are central to the effective accomplishment of central banking objectives and expectations in any part of the world, including this one. Uh, I'm told by my colleagues these aspirations are going very well. Several joint working papers, some journal publications, regional conferences and DFAT training programs have already been produced as part of the capacity building program to date. For our staff also, it's been a very important learning and collaborative experience. We've signed a regional MOU with the five central banks for PhD programs, where Griffith covers the tuition and medical insurance and the central banks cover the stipend. Unfortunately, as with so many plans for this year, it wasn't possible to start this in 2020 due to the financial and economic ramifications of COVID-19. But we do look forward to its commencement soon, especially as the co-funded PhD program makes this capacity building initiative special. Uh, and I always think these programs are incredibly important because when you have PhDs, that means you have a legacy that goes on for decades to come uh, and not just at a particular moment in time. It's the successful execution of this regional PhD MOU that motivated all the partners to convert the bilateral capacity development MOUs into a regional one. It's a historical moment indeed for all of us. Facilitated by the South Pacific Centre for Central Banking, Griffith is tremendously pleased, honoured and privileged to be part of this momentous and immensely rewarding journey. 
I don't need to tell all of you that we're holding this event in the shadow of devastating financial and economic consequences nationally and globally of COVID-19. Central banks around the world, including in the South Pacific region, have had to do a lot of heavy lifting this year, and that's only likely to continue. The response and actions required by central banks have been unprecedented and indeed themselves have consequences, raising challenges for global economies and financial systems alike. This only reinforces how important this forum is in providing an opportunity for all of us to learn from one another in meeting the challenges of this pandemic. The crux of the forum is indeed information sharing and of course enhancing the regional spirit. As always, Griffith is most happy to be involved. The presence of numerous prominent and highly credible institutions from the region and beyond demonstrates the significance of this forum and the importance of the discussions taking place. I'm confident that many of today's conversations will develop into questions for research, will develop then into policy and implementation. Griffith would very much like to remain part of the further opportunities to collaborate and engage with the region and with the program stakeholders. We've benefited enormously already, we hope you have, and there's so much more we can do together. I wish you well in this endeavour, and I am very happy once again to welcome each of you to this inaugural event. I would now ask the governors, if they could please, to take the memorandum of understanding and a pen, and we will engage in a virtual signing together. Oh, we're going to take a photo apparently, so we we all have to hold it up at the same moment so that they can uh, can see all of us. There. Well, thank you very much, friends. That's wonderful to have achieved the signing of this MOU, uh, and I'd now hand back to the organisers. Good, good morning, uh, honourable uh, honourable minister. Good morning. How are you? I'm good, thank you, sir. Um, welcome to this forum for the uh, South Pacific Central Bank Virtual Governors Forum. And yes. I'd now like to invite you, because I understand you have a very busy schedule, um, to please deliver your address, sir. Thank you. Yeah, thanks so much. And I apologize. We're here in Parliament. Parliament is in session at the moment. And uh, it's Remembrance Day. And you know, as a former uh, military officer myself and uh, um, Assistant Defence Minister, we've got to go down to our war memorial, so um, very shortly. But look, I'm, I'm going to get straight into it because uh, it's a great opportunity and thank you to the Griffith University and the Asian Development Bank for hosting and I want to acknowledge Professor Carolyn Evans and the Vice-Chancellor and President of Griffith University and uh, obviously look forward to the contributions from central bank governors. If I can't hear them myself, my office will make sure that I'm, I'm brought up to date with your views. and. Uh, of course, we appreciate the leadership roles of you as governors of these important institutions in a, in a very difficult time for all of us worldwide, but also in our region uh, economically. Um, and I think you know the health and the economic challenges we're facing from COVID-19 in the Pacific region has its own flavour to it. Um, Australia uh, really has been uh, very grateful to the countries of the Pacific, uh, to the work they've done to secure their health systems, to secure their borders, to prevent COVID. It's been the best choice that countries could have made rather than deal with the substantial health and economic impacts of an outbreak. And even though it's had costs, uh, we're, we're just very grateful to the Pacific Timor Leste and all, the, all of our region for the way they've conducted themselves. So, you know, again, in this forum, I just say thank you and congratulations. And, and we've enjoyed partnering to make sure that security has prevented some of the worst outcomes from occurring. Um, the consequence of that, of course, as you know, um, is the deep economic implications that face us now. And, uh, at, you know, we've achieved great success in the health space and socially and uh, securing our countries, but economically that will have a consequence. And uh, just like the rest of the world, we'll have a, a challenge economically now to, uh, to tackle it from the border closures and the broader global downturn that will affect all economies worldwide. Uh, you know the ADB is forecasting a contraction in regional GDP uh, just in the Pacific of about 6.1% this year uh, and many Pacific countries will see negative growth in 2021 and continue to see that negative growth for a while and, and that might set them apart from the rebound that we're hoping to see in Asia and different parts of Southeast Asia, so a serious challenge for all of us to confront. Um, Pacific economies, the, the countries I've been speaking to, uh, Fiji, Vanuatu, Papua New Guinea, Solomons, um, that rely on tourism in particular, 
or certain commodity exports uh, are likely to face some of the most severe impacts. And we've got that at the front of our mind and what we can do in our region to assist. Um, and I guess as International Development Minister in Australia, the, the, the concern is the hard won gains in development and human development that we've made in recent times will be under threat. And, and you know, the forecast of half a million people being pushed into extreme poverty across our region is, is, a, is a very difficult um, assumption for us to, to think about. Uh, and uh, if we see that you know, contraction in household income and household consumption, um, uh, you know, of up to 10%, you know, we, we all understand how serious uh, this challenge will be. Uh, and uh, look, we've also been grateful to Pacific governments for the work they've done in putting in place business support packages, um, social welfare, anything that, you know, we've been able to do to keep stability and certainty for people, for families, for businesses has been uh, welcome. So we, we, we congratulate governments on that as well. Turning to, I think, some of the matters that, you know, affect, uh, you know, uh, central banks, um, obviously we're cognizant of the strain, uh, the significant strain, the fiscal responses that will put on government budgets. Um, revenues will be slashed and spending is dramatically increased. We've had that here in Australia. We're seeing it all around the world. And of course, debt will increase as well. And we all know, depending on a country's starting debt position, that can be quite challenging. Um, you know, so we understand the debt implications as well. And we're conscious too that the crisis will induce currency and balance of payments pressures in many countries. And um, these are of great concern, uh, I'm sure, to yourselves. Um, and, you know, when you couple that with the reduced demand for exports from many countries, um, and, uh, uh, you know, we, we, we've seen increased and enhanced uh, kind of requests from countries for uh, IMF assistance to assist with balance of payments issues. And look, we've been very supportive of this and we've been advocating from Australia for more international finance to be made available from multilateral banks, from um, world for and global forums, from you know, you know, private sector investment, anything we can encourage. Our Prime Minister has spoken at the highest levels to ensure that the, the region is considered in uh, the flows of finance. Um, look, the cumulative effect of this uh, and all these pressures that I'm talking about uh, really puts us in some of the most difficult and challenging economic times any of us have lived through. And uh, we're, we're, we're gonna make sure our assistance to the region and to all of your uh, countries is, is timely and, and remains properly calibrated. And you know, we've been a big partner for a long time. We're gonna remain a big partner. And we've increased our own support um, during this time to respond. And it's something I wanted to address briefly to the, today, our development assistance um, has ramped up and, and it's been tailored to the needs of the Pacific countries in Timor Leste. Um, it's a record 1.44 billion spend this year. But in our budget, um, if you haven't been made aware, it just recently we've announced a $304.7 million COVID-19 response package just for the Pacific. So that's an extra $304 million. Uh, and this is to provide critical temporary economic support, including public health, but also for food security, air connectivity, the things that we know are vital links between us, um, building our, uh, on the support that we put through in partnerships for recovery as well. We can foresee from this fund, you know, budget support or other fiscal measures or programmatic support could be part of the additional $304.7 uh, million. So uh, we've already redirected about $205 million in assistance from any available money from the impacts of COVID that was not able to be spent in normal programs. And that's been well received, uh, but we're thinking ahead as well. And uh, you know, we have um, committed $500 million for the vaccination of countries in the region uh, you know, which of course is going to be most important in all countries in the region. Our Prime Minister has said we'll receive the same vaccine that we provide for Australians. Uh, and we put that 500 million aside to make sure we can deliver on our commitment there for the region. Uh, we've also, as you know, worked hard with governments to establish essentials. I spoke a little bit about air corridors, but we, you know, the humanitarian corridor has been well received internationally um, through the Pacific Islands Forum. And we thank them for their, uh, their uh, their work to help us with that. The Pacific um, Humanitarian Pathway has been, in one sense, um, you know, uh, something that we can take great pride as a region in. I know in the international development space, other ministers from around the world have looked at what we've done in this region as a model for other regions. 
um, and the corridor and, and pathways focus on uh, commercial and chartered options um, to maximise the ability of transport services. It's a model I can believe um, we will have to invest in and think about going forward as well with, um, with uh, our commitment to ongoing air uh, capability in the region. So while preparing for a vaccine, I think we're pretty open-minded, clear-eyed about the profound economic challenges for the region and we're taking steps to support government budgets uh, and you've seen significant budget support in some countries announced. Um, uh, we want to alleviate debt burdens and obviously we've suspended debt repayments in various countries and other things. But we want to stimulate incomes regionally and the private sector where we can do so um, to keep a pipeline of investment coming forward. Our uh, $304 million package is going to prioritise grant-based financing to government partners in the Pacific and Timor-Leste and support um, existing health and economic infrastructure as the, we view as the most important support that we can provide. Um, look, it's beyond our own direct financing. I think um, one of our biggest value adds in the region is that work we've done in, in international financial institutions to leverage concessional budget support. And if you, uh, with your governments and countries, identify increased needs for this concessional budget support, we are available to help advocate uh, you know, with those international financial institutions in the region to, to, to unlock whatever concessional finance we can. Um, you know, we've seen many countries uh, receive IMF emergency funding. Um, you know, I've spoken a little bit about multilateral development banks, uh, you know, who have had some good, you know, we've had some good wins with some of the multilateral de development banks in this period. But as I said, if there's more we can do to help, we will. And uh, given the expected debt sustainability challenges that we're seeing as well, we're also focused on that relief of debt burden that I've spoken about um, that will be faced by many countries in this region. We want to try and avoid, in, in, from our government's point of view, situations where your countries are forced to drastically cut needed expenditure or take, you know, a dramatic further non-concessional loans, you know, if that can be avoided. And we're reviewing our own lending and, uh, you know, we're certainly, as I said, suspending debt payments and doing things that you would under, expect in this period um, to provide that temporary relief. Uh, but, you know, let's make no mistake, and I speak to everybody here when I say this, it's, it's a critical role performed by uh, fiscal regulatory bodies, um, such as yours, uh, that inspires confidence in partners, including us, and amongst international lenders. And, and I spend time talking to international business, and the confidence that you can provide to those bodies is critical, and it will be increasingly critical at this time, so I appreciate the role you're playing but maintaining the integrity of, of the sovereign financial systems that uh, you maintain is critical for our own budget support and the budget support we will provide in coming times, but it will also be in that international space as well. It's all about confidence, as you know, and the confidence inspired by the reassuring presence of sound regulator, uh, regula regulators and sound regulation. Um, you know, you, I don't need to tell you how critical that is for private sector growth and, uh, and certainly the recovery phase that we all want to see come on as quickly as possible from COVID, um, it will form the basis of long-term viability if we have that, that good quality regulatory bodies like yourself. Um, Australia's provided support over many years to, to develop a thriving private sector in our region. I had representatives here from the region in business in my office just this week, uh, and I try and stay in regular contact with them. Our private Sector Development Initiative has provided technical assistance to 13 countries, um, stimulate inclusive private sector-led growth. And, you know, the better regulation that we see is, um, is obviously critical as well. Uh, and of course, the uh, International Finance Corporation Pacific Partnership stimulates that investment as well. Uh, we understand the importance of things like remittances. Um, you know, we've seen some good initiatives to lower the cost of remittances, which is good. I think those things will be even more vital at this time. Um, our Pacific Labor Scheme and our Labor Mobility Schemes to keep flows of revenue returning to your countries. You know, we've, we, we're continuing to negotiate bringing people forward into Australia. And of course, um, you know, the, the work that's done in, by central banks in, in all the different sectors, including, um, you know, digital, fintech, you know, taking advantage of the, of the relative competitive advantages that countries can have in, in a difficult time like COVID for mobility is important. Um, look, in our recovery, COVID, um, you know, the importance of uh, timely action and 
well-considered advice from central banks um, is only going to become more important. Uh, I, I really do commend you for the work you've done so far. It's, it's, it's been good. You know, we have good stability in the region and, you know, we, we have that confidence there right now. Um, it's a credit to the capacity and the adaptation of all of, of your institutions, of your boards, uh, of governments, and we're going to have to continue to adapt together. The relationship between central banks in Australia and New Zealand with our counterparts is, is going to continue to be a value asset for us. So it's always good to have our central banks with relationships with your central banks. Um, that, that, that provides that confidence as well and that sharing of expertise, importantly insights, and also your insight about what we can do or what needs to be done and when it needs to be done is, is absolutely vital. So today I don't have a lot of time to go through some other points because of you know, time constraints, but I do want to say, um, you know, we are here as a, as a country, Australia stands ready to assist um, across the health and economic spec spectrum in the region. Um, we know we stand a lot to learn from the collective experience of, of yourselves, but we, we really are going to go through this together as a region uh, economically and, and your institutions are going to be vital in the challenges we face. So I look forward to the opportunity to discuss the shared challenges. We do want to hear from you. Um, we do want to hear from you regularly as we go forward in that adaptation um, so we can meet the shared challenges and, and, and provide the shared solutions. So thank you for your time today and I apologise about the time constraints. But anyway, thank you so much for your- Thank you so much. Binaka. Thank you, have a great day. Thank you. Um, ladies and gentlemen, that was the uh, Honourable Minister for Defence, uh, uh, Assistant, Minister, Assistant Minister for Defence and Minister for International Development for the Pacific, the Honourable Alex Hawke with those opening words. Uh, as we have had, had some slight amendments to the program, um, uh, due to the Minister's busy schedule, he had to, uh, um, of course, leave early and, of course, and now it is uh, my pleasure to invite uh, Governor and Chairman of the Board of uh, Papua New Guinea, uh, Governor Bakani. Welcome, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Marvin. Good morning, everyone. Uh, fellow governors of the South Pacific uh, Center for Central Banking. Group, Deputy Governor, Senior Management of the Central Banks of uh, Fiji, PNG, Solomon Islands, Vanuatu, and Timor-Leste. Uh, colleagues from the Reserve Bank of Australia, uh, Reserve Bank of New Zealand, and our partners from the World Bank Group, Asia Development Bank, International Monetary Fund, Asia Pacific Business Council, and lastly, but not the least, our esteemed host from Griffith University. Uh, fellow governors, we are remotely but virtually connected this morning to conclude a small but very significant ceremony to formalize the regional memorandum of understanding on the collaboration, collaborative research program between our respective central banks and Griffith University. And who would have known since our last meeting in Port Vila on Uatu just over a year ago that we will be meeting like this in 2020, virtually. Having to do almost everything online, undertaking our jobs and living our lives in a new normal environment as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. We in the Pacific region have experienced shocks of various kinds with devastating impact on our economies and lives. Most, if not all, are not our own doing. And COVID-19 pandemic is like a sledgehammer dropped on our sinking islands already, suffering from the impact of the climate change, which we now have to deal with and live and deal with. Given these challenges, there is a real need for greater cooperation and collaboration amongst the central banks in the region to share and to learn from each other's experience, research, and find solutions to ensure resilience of a smaller open economies. Fellow governors and colleagues, we have come a long way together since the beginning, since the signing of our bilateral MOUs, which started back in 2016. Our efforts have evolved since then 
as we learned and address issues through appropriate policy responses. This now demands a regional approach and collaboration, which brings us to today's event. It has been desire of the, the bank, central banks in the South Pacific region to build capacity and our policy formulation supported by evidence-based scientific empirical research. This aspiration is now being realized by way of a joint research work and training between our central banks and Griffith University. Our bilateral MOUs have enabled our staff and Griffith University to produce joint working papers over the past few years. These research papers are for the first time being published in international refereed journals and presented at regional research conferences. At last year's regional conference in Vanuatu, we agreed to expand our capacity building program further. An MOU for regional PhD program to be co-funded with the Griffith University was signed. This will involve our staff to do independent research. The regional MOU will replace and improve on the current bilateral capacity building MOUs. And here we are today, signing it and taking it into effect. Joint research with Griffith University is not only important in developing our staff capacities and skill sets, but also facilitating regional collaboration. Like all collaboration, it is a two-way street where our staff learn from those at the University of Griffith University, who can also learn from us as we do from other members, central banks. Skills transfer and the knowledge development can only come about when we work together as equal partners towards achieving our common goals. Only then our regional MOU deliver on the aspirations and convictions we share. On behalf of my fellow governors, I would like to thank Griffith University and the South Pacific Center for Central Banking for their ongoing commitment and assistance towards this endeavor. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, Governor, for those wonderful words of support. Vinaka. And now, ladies and gentlemen, uh, as we've had some slight changes to the program this morning, it is my pleasure to uh, introduce to you a gentleman who needs no introduction. Um, let's invite Dr. Pramendra Sharma. Um, he's the conveyor for this, uh, for this session and of course the driving force behind this partnership. Uh, Dr. Pramendra, can you join us please? Mervin, very good morning to you and very good morning to everyone. Um, yes, I was going to be uh, in the program a bit earlier, but that's fine. Um, uh, so let me just begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which we are all virtually meeting today and pay my respect to the elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Uh, let me also respectfully acknowledge the presence of uh, and some of our um, speakers have already left now, but Professor Caroline Evans, the Vice Chancellor and President uh, of Griffith University, Honorable Alex Hope, Minister for International Development and the Pacific and Assistant Defense Minister. Of course, the governors, Deputy Governors, Senior Management and colleagues of Central Banks of Fiji, Papua New Guinea, Solomon Islands, Vanuatu and Timor-Leste. And uh, not forgetting, of course, colleagues from Reserve Bank of Australia, Reserve Bank of New Zealand, World Bank Group, Asian Development Bank, International Monetary Fund, our very important stakeholders and partners in this program, and the Australian Pacific Business Council, and of course, our Griffith University colleagues. Very good morning to you all, and thank you very much for your time this morning, and a very warm welcome to each one of you. Um, Professor Evans has already done that too. Um, I am reminded of an event in the region recently where one of the governors had remarked, we keep breaking new ground in response to the many remarkable accomplishments of the SPCCB program, especially in a relatively short time. And here we are today continuing with that tradition. 
two events we have in this morning's program. The first, which is already, uh, we have already com completed that, but that was the signing of the Regional Capacity Building Memorandum of Understanding. And uh, following that is the main event, which is a governor's Q&A session relating to the impact of the COVID-19. So first, the regional MOU. Uh, the capacity building program has been in place for a few years, as Professor Evans has mentioned as well. And under bilateral MOUs with the central banks of Fiji, Papua New Guinea, Solomon Islands, Vanuatu, and Timor Leste, Griffith has been mentoring and helping develop and enhance research and policy formulation skills at the South Pacific Central Banks. And um, pleased with the collaborations with Griffith so far and to enhance a truly emerging regional model, cooperation and spirit, the central bank governors have been encouraged to convert the bilateral capacity building MOUs into a regional one. Uh, you might also be aware, and as Professor Evans has mentioned this morning, we also have a regional PhD MOU, hoping to commence with the, that sometimes next year. It was going to be this year, but because of COVID-19, we were not able to do that. So that has also been an inspiration, a motivation for the governors and Griffith University to move from bilateral capacity building MOUs to a regional capacity building MOU. So that is that has been the first part of today's program. We have completed that now. The signing is done, and we have uh, in store. We have uh, a few um, interesting and um, uh, important things uh, that we have planned for the coming years, beginning next year, uh, with that MOU. The second part of today's session, which is going to start soon, is the Q and A session. Uh, with the governors. So commencing in 2018, we have had annual regional conferences, which has been a great opportunity for central bank researchers and others to present their findings and for networking among central banks of the region and key stakeholders, the stakeholders that I have mentioned earlier, including RBA, RBNZ, IDB, World Bank, and IMF, of course. Due to COVID-19, we've had to postpone the 2020 Honiara conference to next year now. It was going to be this year, around this time, actually. That was the plan. So we have uh, had to postpone that it will be next year now. There was an interest, however, to have a regional event in 2020, regardless, and be it virtual. There have also been some questions on the minds of central bank colleagues and others relating to COVID-19. The governors have once again been very kind and accommodating. Their immense support for the program is yet again evident. And thank you very much once again, governors, for that. The second and the main event this morning is this Q&A session with the governors of the five central banks of the South Pacific. And that will be facilitated by the director of ADB's Sydney office and the director of uh, Griffith Asia Institute. And uh, that's all I wanted to say to uh, lead us to the next session now. And I think there might now be some changes uh, in terms of starting the next session. So Mevin, thank you very much for that opportunity. And over to you now. Thank you, Mevin. Thank you, Dr. Sharma, for those wonderful words. It's always a pleasure to hear from you. Um, this forum is, uh, is a very, very important part of bilateral relations between central banks across the Pacific, and you are very much a driving force behind that. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, firstly, a big benava level to our uh, Assistant Minister for Defense, the Honorable uh, Minister Hawke, for joining us uh, for the opening session. A uh, big benava level to our governors for uh, the signing of the uh, of the of the accord to ensure that this relationship is strengthened going forward. Uh, we do have some amendments to the opening session, which will be coming up shortly. Uh, we have the apologies from Governor Arif Ali of the uh, Reserve Bank of Fiji, uh, who is unfortunately uh, being called away to an external meeting. He will be replaced by the Deputy Governor of the Reserve Bank of Fiji, Mr. Esala Masitambua. And uh, with that, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we will now be taking a uh, very, very short break in which we will uh, reconvene for the discussion 
on opportunities and challenges for central banking, COVID-19 and the Pacific Island countries uh, at 10 a.m. Brisbane time. So if you could lock that in and we'll be back at exactly 10 a.m. Brisbane time. Good night, guys.